Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll get started right, uh, right at 10 o'clock on the dot. Minat is very pleased to welcome Jill Sutherland today from Cadet. And um, we're very excited to have all of you join us. I'm going to turn it right over to Jill, who is going to tell you all the wonderful things about what the evidence is. Okay, great. Thank you very oh, much. You know what? And I'm just going to make sure that they can see. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Orvi and Christine, for inviting me to be the MyNet webinar special guest today. And hello to all of you. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, so today I have been invited to share a little bit about uh, CADIS and what it is we do. So if those of you who are not familiar with CADIS, CADIS is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology oh, and Health. Just, um, just bear with us, we're having a little technical glitch, my slides aren't advancing. Perfect. So CADIS is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health. I am Jill Sutherland, I'm the Manitoba Liaison Officer and I am based in Winnipeg, but I cover the province of Manitoba. So just a quick disclosure slide, um, CADIS is funded by provincial and territorial uh, and federal ministries of health. We do receive application fees for three of our programs, the Common Drug Review, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, and our Scientific Advice Program. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about each of those programs in just a few minutes. So the learning objectives for today's session uh, are to define and provide examples of health technology assessment, discuss the role of health technology assessment or HTA uh, in supporting evidence-informed healthcare policy and decision making and then also to describe CADIS reports and services and how you can access them and me as a resource. Yeah, I think you just want to click on that screen. Oh this one. Yeah. Okay. And then Is that the right one or is this one? No, nope, that's the right one. Okay, there. Okay, so CADIS was um, founded in 1989 by federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health. And at that time, we were tasked with coordinating a pan Canadian effort to health technology assessment. And over the years, our scope has expanded. Uh, and now we are responsible for health technology assessment related to drugs. Uh, medical devices, including surgical, dental uh, procedures, as well as diagnostic imaging and lab testing. Yeah, so I think because we're just gonna oh, make sure that Jill's slides mm -hmm. are keeping up here. Okay, give that a try. Okay. So based on our funding model, um, we do have a defined uh, customer base. Um, who are eligible to request uh, our services. Uh, and that includes government policy and decision makers, as I know many of you uh, attending the webinar are, public drug plan managers, regional health authorities, hospitals, and other healthcare facilities like Cancer Care Manitoba or Addictions Foundation Manitoba and Shared Health, uh, as well as health professionals, which includes physicians, nurses, and all other allied health professions. Um, because of our funding model, there are some groups that are not considered eligible to request uh, our services, and that would include um, academic institutions and researchers acting, working within those institutions, uh, as well as national organizations, for example, Diabetes Canada or the Lung Association, uh, as well as the public and media. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about uh, how available our reports are uh, on the CADIS website. Is it possible to have these catch up with? Yeah, you know what? We'll just, I think we'll restart the slides. Okay. It was working before there. So everybody, we're just gonna um, stop the slideshow and we will restart. So just use the arrows. This is the right one? Or one more? Um, 
this one. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So before we sort of dive into some of the work that Cadith undertakes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what our definition of a health technology is. And broadly speaking, when we're talking about health technologies, we're talking about any intervention that is directly involved in patient care that has a specific health outcome for those patients. Um, so it, it can be anything that's used for the treatment, mitigation or prevention of symptoms or disease or any health condition or abnormal state. Um, so this does include pharmaceuticals. And when we talk about pharmaceuticals, uh, this includes blood products, vaccine and prescription and non-prescription medicines. Um, with respect to medical, dental and surgical, this includes devices and procedures. Uh, and diagnostic testing includes lab tests, screening programs and diagnostic diagnostic imaging, so ultrasound, x-ray, uh, CT scans, MRI scans. Um, and also just to note that when we're talking about um, medical procedures or interventions, health technologies also include clinical interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, trauma-informed counseling for post-traumatic stress disorder, the use of telehealth, so it really is a very broad scope. Um, so if you have a question that you're wondering uh, if it's something that Cadith could address, please by all means uh, get in touch with me and we can have a conversation uh, about whether or not it might be in or out of scope for us. Some topic areas that are generally not considered to be a health technology uh, include things like health system design, uh, program delivery, health facility design, so the construction of a new hospital or an operating room suite, um, and things that are concerned with finance and budgets. So a couple of examples of health technologies um, as they would relate to a condition like diabetes. So if we think about pharmaceuticals, um, health technology would include things like insulin therapies uh, and drugs for the treatment of diabetes. With respect to medical devices and supplies, uh, this includes things like self-monitoring of blood glucose, so the use of test strips to monitor uh, sugar levels. Um, a diagnostic technology related to diabetes would be diabetes screening for asymptomatic adults. Um, and with respect to a procedure, uh, it may be looking at diabetes management in the long-term care population. So when we talk about optimal use um, and health technologies, uh, we really are talking about adopting and implementing technology that provides the greatest benefit and outcomes uh, from the resources that are invested. Uh, so we invest a large amount of uh, dollars in our healthcare system in Canada, the annual expenditure uh, for on healthcare is upwards of 240 billion. And if you look at provincial and territorial budgets, that represents 35 to 40% of the budgets. Um, so we really want to ensure that when we are investing um, our money into health technologies, that we're getting the best value uh, for the money invested so that we can improve the uh, health outcomes of our population. So, Optimal use looks at how and when we use technologies um, to make sure that the benefits exceed the health risks of the new technology. Um, it's also look at, looking at determining settings uh, where patient, where and or with which patients um, the technology may have the most benefit and where it shows both clinical and cost effectiveness advantages. Um, optimal use is also about not using technologies that have uh, no evidence of benefit and, and avoiding unnecessary care or tests and treatments. Uh, and an example of this is work that's also being undertaken by Choosing Wisely Canada, uh, where physicians have identified you know, hundreds of tests for which there isn't strong evidence that uh, their use is appropriate um, and actually can, and can cause more harm uh, than benefit to patients. So an example of optimal use um, that CADS undertook um, some evidence assessment around was the use of DocuSafe for constipation. Um, and when we looked at the evidence, we found that there really isn't strong evidence to support its effectiveness. Um, and so even though it's inexpensive, prescribing a drug that is not clinically effective really can never be considered to be cost effective. And as a result of the work undertaken by CADS, DocuSafe was removed from the formularies uh, in eight jurisdictions across the country. So when we're determining optimal use, how do we do that? Uh, well, we very much look to see what the evidence says. So we are looking at the evidence from a health technology assessment lens. We frame research questions in a way that will support decision making. So we look at does intervention X offer a clinical advantage? Is intervention X cost effective? And who would benefit from the use of the new technology? So 
the purpose of health technology really is to inform healthcare related decision making in um, in healthcare. Um, it is a research approach that summarizes and critically appraises a body of evidence. So we'll talk a little bit about the standard hierarchy of evidence and where HTA fits in that landscape. Um, but with health technology, there is a rigor to the methodology. Um, and an, inter an interdisciplinary team conducts the review, which includes research information spe specialists, clinical research associates, uh, clinical experts, and health economists. Um, just important to note, too, that health technology assessment is not generating new evidence, so it's not conducting uh, randomized controlled trials um, or retrospective studies. It really is informing what the collective evidence says uh, about a technology to ensure that we are making decisions that um, ensure we get the greatest benefit possible from the money and resources that we're investing in the healthcare system. We just have a, I noticed a question has popped mm -hmm. up, so we'll take a look. Are you able to um, share a copy of your presentation? Sure, and I believe this is being recorded too. That's right. So what we will do at the end of the session then today, um, when we send out, we'll do a little evaluation, we can send out your slides and we'll also send out the link to the recording as well. Absolutely. Oh, and I'm just gonna close that for you. So why does health technology assessment matter? What is its relevance um, in the healthcare system? I mean, with the plethora of evidence that is available, um, what does the added value that health technology assessment adds? Um, so we mentioned that health technologies drives a great deal of healthcare spending. There are many disruptive technologies that are coming to market and are hot topics these days, things like artificial intelligence, 3D printing, robotics, remote monitoring, um, and they certainly offer hope for breakthroughs and improved treatment of patients and improved patient incomes, outcomes but they also create demands for new healthcare spending. Um, and even if they are effective, some of them carry a significant price tag. Uh, when we think about niche drugs like CAR T cell therapy for treating cancers and drugs for rare diseases. Uh, so really decision makers are faced with a challenge uh, when they're deciding to buy which innovations to buy, what price should be paid for these, how many should be implemented and how to foster appropriate use amongst clinicians. Um, and so if these decisions are not made from an evidence lens, there is concern that the forces of innovation and marketing will drive the adoption of new technology rather than looking to what the evidence says. I think you just no, click on that. the mouse again. Yeah, just to click there. And then, then you see Okay, so there is no shortage of evidence. Uh, sometimes keeping abreast of current evidence is likened to drinking uh, water from a fire hose or a shower, uh, but there is value in looking at the collective body of evidence. Um, so in this study, um, it looked at 49 highly cited original medical studies. 14 were later either contradicted by later studies or were found to have much smaller effects than the original articles first suggested. So this really is to highlight why it is important to look at a body of evidence rather than a single study. So this is the standard hierarchy of evidence. Um, many of you may be familiar with it. Um, at the bottom, you'll see there's editorials or expert opinion. So you may have a group of physicians or other healthcare professionals who have experience treating a certain condition or disease um, and who come together to form an opinion or make a statement about the best approach to treating. Uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses are generally considered to be the highest level of evidence uh, and in that case um, the collective body of evidence is examined so the results of many studies are pooled and synthesized uh, to inform um, decision making. Now a colleague of mine has taken some artistic liberty and added health technology assessment to, uh, to the top of the hierarchy. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what health technology assessment sort of adds in addition to what a systematic review or a meta-analysis might consider. So when we're looking at a health technology uh, assessment, at the end of the day, it will include several components uh, that take into consideration a clinical review, as well as an economic analysis, implementation considerations, ethical considerations, um, patients and caregivers are provided a, um, an opportunity to share their experience, either using a drug or a new technology, and uh, clinician perspectives are also taken into consideration. So questions that an HTA um, answers are things like, is it safe? For whom does it work? And when does it work? 
is it better than what we already have or do? So is a new drug superior or more cost effective or more clinical effective than a drug that we already have available to treat a certain condition? Uh, does it provide value for money? Uh, can we afford it or can we afford not to adopt this technology? Uh, and if so, and with some of these drugs that carry a high price tag, is there a trade-off that if we implement this new technology, we'll have to give up something else in the healthcare system? And are there other needs that need to be considered? So healthcare technology assessment can support decision-making in a number of ways. So public funding or reimbursement decisions. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Common Drug Review and the Pan-Canadian Oncology Review and how HT supports decision-making in those areas. Um, it also can help inform purchasing or procurement decisions. Um, it can help with the selection of interventions for implementation. Um, many groups use HTA to develop evidence-based practice guidelines or protocols. And there's also a value in re-examining um, long-standing practice to see if technologies that we implemented in the past still have value, uh, or perhaps um, there might be value in disinvestment. So just one quick slide, just to sort of highlight the difference between HTA recommendations versus clinical practice guidelines. So with respect to a health technology assessment, it is a research approach that is consistent and rigorous. Uh, whereas with clinical practice guidelines, the methodology can vary depending on the guideline group that is developing it. Within a health technology assessment, there is assessment of cost effectiveness or value uh, for money. Clinical practice guidelines generally do not consider that aspect um, of the technology. Uh, and HTA is very much looked at from a population perspective. So it's considering the wide use of resources uh, and uh, obtaining the greatest good for the greatest number. Whereas clinical practice guidelines are written more so from a clinician perspective, written for individual practitioners who are making treatment decisions about individual patients. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about CADA's programs and services. We do have a wide suite of uh, programs and services to support decision-making needs. And we sort of operate in four main areas. Um, drugs and medical devices are our two primary streams of work. Uh, we also offer scientific advice. Um, so pharmaceutical companies who are in the early days of the drug development process um, can um, hire Cadeth to provide advice on uh, design of their clinical trials and guidance about the regulation and approval status uh, in Canada. And then at the end, I'll also talk about our implementation support and knowledge mobilization team that I am a part of. So Cadeth is responsible for the Common Drug Review as well as the Pan-Canadian Oncology, uh, Pan Oncology Review. Um, and we are responsible for making reimbursement recommendation to Canada's public drug plans to guide their funding decisions. So the road to reimbursement uh, can be lengthy. So after um, a new drug comes to market, Health Canada reviews uh, the evidence submitted by the pharmaceutical manufacturer to assess whether or not it is effective, is it safe, and does it work. Um, pharmaceutical companies will then submit a request to CADIF uh, requesting a review, and CADIF will undertake a review that looks at the clinical effectiveness and the cost effectiveness, as well as patient perspectives. Um, the Drug Expert Review Committee will make a recommendation to public drug plans whether or not the drug should be funded. Um, and after that, uh, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance is an organization which negotiates drug prices on behalf of provinces and territories. Uh, so after um, a manufacturer has submitted a drug to CADIS Common uh, Drug Review, there are multiple steps occur uh, before a recommendation is issued. And I'm not going to walk through all of them, um, but just to note that the first step is a call for patient input is posted. So patient groups have an opportunity uh, to share their experience um, with using the drug. Uh, and this input is considered by the CADIS review team when they're developing protocols and reports. It's also deliberated on by expert committees, um, and these and patient input is is very much reflected uh, in the recommendations that CADIF is issuing. And then finally, patient input is also shared with drug plans, and it's posted publicly on the CADIF website. 
So it is the Canadian Drug Expert Committee. Um, there are 14 members of the committee, and that includes physicians, pharmacists, uh, and public members. And they deliberate on a number of areas before they issue a recommendation, uh, which is then shared with the public drug plan. Um, and just a slide that demonstrates the scope of the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. Uh, so once CADETH has issued um, a recommendation, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance may then enter uh, into negotiations to negotiate a, a, a price for the drug on behalf of provinces and territories. Uh, the negotiated drug prices uh, are not made public um, when and if they have reached um, an agreement on a drug price a drug price, uh, they sign a letter of intent uh, that is then shared with the provinces and ultimately it is the health minister in each province who has the final decision as to what drugs will be covered by the provincial drug program um, but his decision very much is informed by CADET's review as well as the drug standards and therapeutic committee, uh, other staff at Manitoba Health um, and other considerations like the political environment that may be in play um, at the time of the decision. So with respect to our health, te te health technology management program, uh, we have a number of programs and services um, to support decision making. So when we look at meeting decision making needs, we look at providing rapid assessments and these are typically decisions that are made reacting to a decision problem. So these tend to be um, shorter, more rapid turnaround that may not provide a 360 view or analysis of, of health technology or condition, but rather a dimension must be identified. Um, and oftentimes this may also be a case where a decision will be made with or without evidence or the decision uh, the technology, the assessment is being undertaken to sort of validate a clinical practice that is that is already in use. Sort of traditional assessments, a full health technology assessment, um, tend to be undertaken um, in anticipation of a future decision problem, and they're very much comprehensive um, and include the components that we discussed earlier. Uh, and the decision, you know, can to some extent wait until all of the evidence is in before a decision is made. So the first service that I wanted to talk about is our rapid response service. Um, so this is a service that, um, depending on the question or need um, at hand, we are able to generate anything from a reference list up to a summary with critical appraisal. Uh, the turnaround time for that service depends on the level of detail required, uh, but it can range from you know, 10 to 30 business days. Um, and these are just a few examples of rapid response reports that we've generated in the last month, just to give you a sense of some of the scope and the breadth of, of topics that we're addressing. Now, my, my friends at MyNet are going to jump in here and talk a little bit about how <laughs> MyNet complements the services that Kenneth is able to provide. Thanks. Thanks, Jill, for that <laughs> intro. <laughs> Chris, do you want to? Oh, Christine's here with I us, can. too. We'll just... Yes, I'm invisible today. Like mm -hmm. You can go closer, a little bit more. Oh, there you go. Uh, musical chairs, yeah. So um, uh, we do a little bit here at MyNet. Uh, many of you will know about our services, so we also do literature searches. And that's where you can write into us or call us and say that you need information about anything. Uh, so we aren't just limited to technolo technologies or drugs. Um, but we only provide you the reference list and then the references from there are yours to uh, analyze and take in as, as you wish. Whereas Kenneth is, has the capacity to take it those next steps so that you can actually find an answer, mm -hmm. right? So it is, should I or shouldn't I be prescribing this? Should we or shouldn't we include this on the formulary? Is this or is this not supported by evidence? that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're really great complementary services. Cadeth will go really to the to the end to give you, well, as often as they can, that <laughs> final, um, final analysis. Sometimes uh, the evidence just isn't there one way or the other. Um, and we're able to provide um, the whole gamut of, of you can ask us about music therapy or <laughs> accountability structures or dealing with change in the, in the dealing with environment. Change, the, the whole spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Did I miss anything? Um, I don't think so. Okay. So yes, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Back to Jill. Okay. And I will note too that your turnaround time is 
quite quick. Oh. So if you have an urgent request and you're looking for what the evidence says, then I, I understand that you can pull together a reference list relatively quickly for folks. Yes, and we do, I mean, we do commonly ask for a minimum of five business days, but sometimes we appreciate that uh, you just need it faster. Um, and so in those instances, uh, you know, if you give us a call and say, here's why I really do need this, um, then we do what we can to accommodate that. Yeah. Whereas your, I think your quickest is 10 days, is that correct? We're usually 10. about 10 business days yeah. to generate a reference list. Um, and oftentimes the reference list may be the first step to sort of say, is there a body of evidence on this topic that sort of merits further investigation? Um, and so that's where the summary of abstracts or summary with critical appraisal come into, uh, come into play. Because when we're looking at a summary with critical appraisal, our research information specialist will actually pull the documents, pull the articles, read the full text of those articles. Um, they will critically appraise um, the research that was conducted and then provide a summary of the evidence as well as key messages that were gleaned from, from those. Um, and those types of reports generally can be quite helpful in terms of decision making um, because it can sometimes provide an answer as to the clinical and cost effectiveness. Uh, one thing I, we didn't mention was also that um, if CADIS did provide you a reference list or any kind, if you were reading any of their reports and you said, oh, I want to read this um, article from it, MyNet can also provide you that full text article as well. So we've talked a lot about health technology assessments already and the comprehensiveness um, and the scope of what a health technology assessment includes. Um, so I just wanted to provide a couple of examples of recent health technology assessments that we have completed, uh, one being screening for chlamydia um, during pregnancy, um, and the second being dental amalgams compared with composite resin. Um, so that's an example when we're comparing two health technologies head to head um, to assess their clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, patient perspectives, clinician perspectives, implementation issues um, uh, in one comprehensive report. We also undertake optimal use reports, which are full health technology assessments, but take that a step further uh, with respect to uh, the expert review committee uh, at CADIS who will consider the health technology assessment results and then make recommendations about the optimal use of a technology. Um, so two that we have recently completed, um, one is interventions for insomnia disorder. So we considered um, drug and non-pharmacological interventions for the treatment of insomnia disorder, um, as well as Chimera for the treatment of pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia and uh, adults that use large B-cell lymphoma. Um, and you may recognize the term CAR T-cell therapy, um, which is what these are. Um, and so that was a recent optimal use report that we, that we undertook and we looked at um, not just the clinical effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of CAR T cell therapies, but also implementation issues and ethical issues um, with respect to equity, um, as well as patient perspectives and clinician perspectives. Um, and um, we have an optimal use project underway. It's in progress, um, soon to be completed by end of this fiscal year, looking at HPV testing for primary cervical cancer screening. We also undertake a fair amount of environmental scanning uh, where we survey either national jurisdictions or international jurisdictions to get a sense of what current practice is around a certain topic. Um, and you can see on the screen a few of the recent environmental scans that we have undertaken. Um, one looked at what is the availability across Canada for non-pharmacological treatments for chronic non-cancer pain. Another looked at ankyloglossia, which is tongue tie um, in breastfeeding infants and what current practices are across the country with respect to um, when and how this procedure is being performed. Uh, and just recently, uh, we published a report, uh, an environmental scan on the detection and diagnosis of sepsis in rural and remote, remote areas um, throughout Canada. So horizon scanning is another one of our services. Um, so we routinely scan um, the international community um, to try and identify new and emerging technologies that we think will have an impact on the Canadian landscape uh, in the coming years. Um, so these 
um, horizon scanning bulletins are, are published a couple of times each year. Uh, so I just provided an example of an October issue where we focused on emerging artificial intelligence technologies. Uh, but certainly if you are aware of new and emerging technologies that you think CAD uh, should be keeping an eye on, please be in touch with me and we can certainly um, work together to move that forward. So just a note about the team that I work with. So I'm a member of our implementation support and knowledge mobilization team. We have liaison officers um, and knowledge mobilization officers located in jurisdictions in provinces and territories across the country. Um, so we very much work to meet your decision making needs um, in terms of generating reports and helping you understand um, and use the evidence. Um, we also do a lot of informa uh, informal information sharing uh, between jurisdictions. So if you have a question that may not necessitate, necessitate a full-scale report, um, certainly I can be in touch with my colleagues across the country um, to get a sense of what's happening in their jurisdictions and I can collate that information or put you in touch with um, other clinicians or policy makers um, in other provinces and territories. So in terms of implementation support services, um, we have a wide range of services that we are able to provide. So we can meet and you know, do an assessment of what your evidence and information needs are. Um, we do a lot of presentations on the evidence um, and what the findings of our reports were. Um, oftentimes with our health technology assessments, they are very comprehensive reports that run into the hundreds of pages. Um, so we have a team of knowledge mobilization officers who are just brilliant um, at developing knowledge mobilization tools that provide plain language summaries of our reports that offer key messages, um, the creation of infographics that summarize reports. Um, and certainly I'm always very happy to work with you to understand what your knowledge mobilization needs might be. Um, and we can work together to customize tools that are very much tailored to either the Manitoba, um, Manitoba context or your regional context, uh, whatever that might be. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of examples of knowledge mobilization tools that were recently created. Um, so the one that you're seeing on your screen here um, is a one page overview of publicly funded and managed naloxone programs in Canada. So it shows um, where sites are, are available and what is covered by each province and territory. And I mentioned the optimal use project that we recently completed um, examining interventions for insomnia disorder um, and one of our knowledge mobilizations officers created this lovely one-page um, overview that summarizes the clinical report, what the findings of the clinical report were, what the findings of patient perspectives and experiences were, as well as the results of our current practice analysis. So we generate all of these tools and reports, uh, but where can you find the evidence? Because our evidence is very much your evidence. Um, all of our reports are freely available on the CADETH website, and it is routinely being updated with new reports. Um, one thing to note is that when we undertake work uh, on behalf of a customer, um, that is confidential. We don't identify you as the customer, um, but we do make the reports publicly available on the website um, so that others um, can also use the information. So one tool that I wanted to mention um, that many people find quite useful um, are evidence bundles. So our knowledge mobilization officers have collated reports on important Canadian topics um, so that all of the work that we've undertaken on a given topic is available uh, in one place. So if you go onto the CADETH website, you will find ev evidence bundles on a number of topics um, that are relevant uh, to Canada's healthcare system today. Uh, diabetes management, um, primary care, mental health. Um, we've done a fair amount of work on opioids uh, recently. Medical cannabis is emerging. Uh, evidence is emerging. Um, and we've done work in pain. Uh, medical imaging, and certainly if there is um, a bundle that you would like to see put together, we would be more than happy to work with you uh, to accommodate that. So if you don't already, uh, I would encourage you to subscribe to CADETH updates. Uh, we routinely send out calls for stakeholder and patient feedback, uh, as well as a monthly newsletter that summarizes uh, recent reports and work that we've undertaken, as well as upcoming events. Um, so if you would like to sign up, please get in touch with me. I will provide you with my contact information at the, at the end of the presentation. 
And we're also active on social media. So you can find us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And I understand that Christine and Orvi recently um, did a webinar on social media. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, if you've recently joined social media or, or have been a long time user, um, look for look for Kadith, uh on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So this is my contact information. As I mentioned, I am based in Winnipeg, but I am Manitoba liaison officer. Um, and so I am always happy to come and meet you in person or via teleconference. Uh, you can contact me at my phone number or via email. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you, that you might have. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you this morning. And uh, if we haven't met already, I hope that, that we'll meet in the future. I uh, certainly encourage you to reach out to me um, with any of your evidence needs. Great. So we'll just um, give everyone a chance to uh, think about their questions. And uh, what do you remember? Is it discussion that their box is called? Um, I think it's just the chat box. Okay, yeah. yeah. You'll have on your screen um, a question or a chat or a discussion box. So you can type in your questions there. And, uh, and and like Jill mentioned, she's happy to answer them. And I mean, I just want to say that sometimes Kadif makes our job so easy <laughs> because sometimes people will ask for something and we'll check Kadif's site and there will be uh, the answer essentially. So we can send that. That's always really helpful um, for us. And I think also it's always very reassuring when we find others who love evidence and use <laughs> evidence as much as we do. Uh, that is always very reassuring to see. Um, so we don't have any questions that have come in yet. We'll just give you another second. So again, um, once the recording is, it takes a little bit for it to get ready to post online. Once it's up and ready, then we will also follow up with copies of the slides and Jill's contact information for everybody to, um, to have. Okay, well, we'll hang out here for a couple of more minutes um, in case anybody does have a question. Otherwise, we thank you very much for coming and stay tuned to come back. More evidence coming your way in Mar March. March. March is our next month where uh, the MyNet session is talking about how to use evidence in your practice. Okay, they're often shy <laughs> with their questions. <laughs> No, it's just working. Oh, no. Oh, oh I have one hand raised. Oh. Seems like someone just raised their hand. So you can oh. if you um, put it out of the, the side, you can expand it to be. This one? Uh, nope, the question. Question one. Uh, on the right hand side, beside the X, there's the make it bigger. Yeah. Oh, up here. Well, was it thank you? Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs> Seeing no further questions, again, um, you're welcome to contact Jill, also us at MyNet, and uh, we'll end there for today. And again, thank you for coming.